and welcome to OCR History B, Making of America, 1789 to 1900. This is the third content video in this series, and this video will focus on the Civil War and Reconstruction, 1861 to 1877. Just a reminder of our timeline for the Making of America, we have five themes throughout the course and you need to know the dates of these confidently as the questions will always have dates attached and to you need to know them to make sure that your evidence is applicable. On the timeline that you can see on screen, the presidents again are at the bottom of the timeline in red. You don't need to know all of these, but you will need to know the names of presidents who passed key legislation. The first theme on America paper, remember, is America's expansion between 1783 and 1838. The second time period is the West. Why did people begin to migrate to the far west of America? And the dates for this period are 1839 to 1860. The third um, time period, which this video is going to focus on, is 1861 to 1877. And that focuses on the Civil War and settlement and conflict on the plains. So this particular video is on the Civil War. The next one will be on settlement and conflict on the plains. And then the final section of our timeline is 1877 to 1900 which is American cultures. So a main theme that you could get asked about for um, this third section of Civil War and Reconstruction 1861 to 1877 is what caused the American Civil War in 1861. There are lots of long term factors and obviously catalysts as well. But we are going to start um, by going through the long term factors for what caused the American Civil War. So first of all, there were economic differences over slavery, which have been discussed in theme one but the main reason that there are economic tensions between north and south is that the north were against slavery because factory owners in the north have to pay their workers which means that they lose uh, some of their profits because they're having to pay wages whereas the south have slavery on plantations which is free labor which means that they retain more of their profit and this causes tension between the north and the south we also have the role of abolitionists. So in North America, we have um, people such as Frederick Douglass, who was an escaped slave, who gave lectures and wrote articles on the immorality of slavery, along with Harriet Tubman, who assisted hundreds of slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad. So these abolitionists caused conflict and tension uh, with the South of America, who obviously believe that slavery is fine and acceptable. We also have the growing political power of the North. So Northern states populations continued to rise as representation in Congress, remember, was dependent on the population of states. The North begins to have more power. So as states and um, populations increase, those states get more power in Congress. And this is happening more in the North. In 1846, Congress had also stated that slavery was to be banned in any new territories gained from Mexico. So the combination of these two things really causes huge tension between North and South, with the South very angry about the North getting more representation in Congress and the fact that slavery is being banned in new territory. Very specific um, compromise that we have is the 1850 compromise made by a Southerner, Henry Clay. And this stated that California could enter the Union as a free state and the sale of slaves would be banned in Washington. But territories gained from Mexico, for example, New Mexico, could decide for themselves whether to allow slavery. Um, and all states had to accept the Fugitive Slave Act, which made it a legal duty to return runaway slaves. So a fugitive is somebody that's run away. So every state has to accept the fact that fugitive slaves, if they are discovered, have to be returned. This sounds more pro-South and this causes tension with the North. It, remember, is allowing slavery to expand with those territories taken from Mexico and it is ensuring that fugitive slaves are returned. So this, as an overall piece of legislation, as much as it's described as a compromise, was seen to be one sided and in favour of the South. We also have the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. This went against the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which remember stated that states below Missouri would be slave and states above would be free. Kansas and Nebraska were both above the line and yet they were allowed to decide whether or not they wanted slavery, which again goes against that agreement of 1820. This causes huge conflict between abolitionists and southerners and there is violence in the Senate and on the streets in what's known as bleeding Kansas due to the amount of bloodshed during this campaign. So this was as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. 
have two political groups. We have the Democrats who are Southern pro plantations. They dislike the factories and they want a strong state government. And then we have the Republicans in the North who are pro factories, pro strong central government and believe that slaveholders were too powerful. So these are the main long term causes of the American Civil War, which means that when this breaks out, these are the reasons that encourage that to happen. In terms of the causes of the American Civil War, we've spoken through the long term causes. We're now going to have a look at what the catalyst of the war was. Um, so we have Buchanan, who is a Democrat, who was elected president in 1856. He was a Southerner who supported the Kansas-Nebraska Act because of those pro-Southern policies. And he also supported the Dred Scott decision, which stated that Congress had no right to ban slavery in the territories because the Constitution stated that all Americans had the right to own property. So remember on the overview video that we did, we spoke about the fact that the South see the slaves as their own property. And this is why he supports the Dred Scott decision. We then see Abraham Lincoln, who's the Republican candidate, emerge. And many previous Democrats had hated Buchanan and so turned to the Republicans and Lincoln instead. Lincoln started to portray himself as Honest Abe, which was the nickname he was given, a man of the people who was hardworking and against the wealthy plantation owners. He promised to stop the expansion of slavery. So at this point, he's not promising to ban slavery, just its expansion. And he also promised a transcontinental railroad, which would run through the northern states and not the southern states. So we can clearly see here he is more pro-northern than pro-southern. And he wins a solid victory in the presidential election in 1860. And this is really the catalyst um, or the trigger that leads to the outbreak of war. Lincoln's election confirmed to many Southerners that the North was going to ban slavery and end their way of life. Remember, Lincoln had promised to ban the expansion of slavery, not ban slavery altogether. But nonetheless, this worries the South enough to start pushing the idea of secession, which is where Southern states opted to leave the Union. So in November 1860, South Carolina became the first state to secede. Another six states follow. In February 1861, the states who had seceded became known as the Confederacy and Jefferson Davis became their leader. Lincoln took his position as president on the 4th of March 1861. On the 12th of April 1861, the Confederacy opened fire on Union troops at Fort Sumner. The American Civil War had begun. So after Lincoln's election, the South see no option but to go to war against the North, which means that they are going to war against the Union. They want to become a separate country seen as the Confederacy and they break away with South Carolina leading the way. So in terms of the American Civil War, it is, runs between 1861 and 1865. And we've got the Union who are northern, for example, New York and California. And we have President Lincoln, who is in charge versus the Confederacy, who are the southern states. Remember, for example, Alabama and Louisiana, who had seceded. Ask paper questions on the African-American experience of the American Civil War. So uh, how did black Americans feel during the war? How were they treated during the war? What was their experience? So we're going to go through some examples that you could discuss if that was to appear on a paper again. So first of all, at the start of the war, life for African-Americans was very much the same as before. In the North, they continued to have low paid jobs, poor quality housing, segregated schools, public places were also segregated. And in the South, slaves were cramped in plantation housing. It was illegal for African-Americans to be educated and slaves were seen as property and they were not able to use any public facilities without permission. So huge amounts of segregation, discrimination, racism in the start of the American Civil War. When the American Civil War began, many black volunteers came forward to join the Union Army. They were not allowed initially as Lincoln didn't want to anger the South anymore. Remember, his aim is to get the Union back together. So he decides that he's not going to allow uh, African-Americans to join the Union Army. However, many slaves were running away and escaping to the Union as they saw that as a place of hope. And Lincoln stated that they could be kept as contraband of war and could work for the Union Army, but not fight rather than being sent back to their masters. So you could easily speak about um, the fact that African-Americans 
were kept as contraband of war. They are allowed to fight. Um, sorry, they are not allowed to fight for the Union Army, but they are allowed to work for them initially. So you could include that in an exam question. In July 1862, we have what's known as the Second Confiscation Act, which meant that any slaveholding land taken by the Union Army automatically becomes free. And you've got an example of the Sea Islands. This is where 10,000 slaves became free and were allowed to keep the land for themselves. And they set up a new town called Mitchellville. So some of you will remember this from class. So the Sea Islands would be a great example to use in the exam very specific, which really shows the African-American experience of the Civil War uh, by 1862 was starting to improve because the Union were taking land and were turning that land free and allowing the slaves to keep that land for themselves. On the 1st of January 1863, huge uh, turning point here, we have the Emancipation Proclamation. So Lincoln announces that millions of slaves were to be promised um, that a Union victory in the American Civil War would gain them their freedom. So this is not Lincoln freeing the slaves at this point. It is a promise that if the Union are successful in the American Civil War, then that is what will happen. In 1863, we see the first African-American regiment. 70% of northern black men joined the Union Army and they were crucial in helping secure a Union victory. However, African-Americans were not allowed to become officers. They were paid less than white soldiers and they were given labour duties to do, for example, digging ditches. Equal pay was finally granted in 1864. But again, if you had a question on the African-American experience of the American Civil War, these would be good pointers to use. Things like the fact that they were not allowed to become officers and they were paid less than white soldiers. Finally, there are some opportunities for freed slaves. So by 1865, we have 200,000 African-Americans who had been taught how to read and write. So literacy rates are on the rise. Ex-slaves who had helped General Sherman against the Confederates were given 40 acres of land and a mule. And the government rented out small farms to ex-slaves and many got jobs such as firemen, barbers and mechanics. So after the Civil War, we can see that we have some real progress for African-Americans in terms of opportunities. But all of these um, points that you can see could be referenced in a question on the African-American experience of the American Civil War. So a key date that you need to remember is the 9th of April, 1865, and this is when the Confederacy surrender. So as a result of this, the Union is kept together. So North and South are still united. They are not separate entities. So Lincoln had won the American Civil War and managed to keep the Union together. We're now going to focus on reconstruction, which is the process of rebuilding or repairing something. In this case, the lives of African-Americans after years of embedded racism and discrimination. You can see the path of reconstruction on the slide, and I need you to think of this as a roller coaster with numerous ups and downs for African-Americans throughout our third time period. You will need to know the different phases of reconstruction and some of the policies passed during these. So when we go through the information in a moment, we're going to start with what Lincoln introduced at the end of the Civil War. But after his assassination, we see a dramatic drop uh, where we see President Johnson take over and he makes many U-turns, uh, which dents the hopes of many African-Americans. So first of all, Lincoln in 1865 follows uh, his promise of the Emancipation Proclamation by issuing the 13th Amendment. This banned slavery in the United States of America, so it is a huge turning point, and it gave many African Americans hope that life under Lincoln's second term as president would continue to improve. However, Lincoln was assassinated less than a week after the Confederacy surrendered, and as a result of this, we see um, Andrew Johnson, who is the next president, make lots of negative changes which are going to affect African Americans. So Vice President Andrew Johnson became president. Many think he's going to follow in Lincoln's footsteps, but that is not what he does. So firstly, he allows the Confederate states to reapply for membership to the Union. These states were readmitted and got their power back straight away. So there is no real punishment for their role in the American Civil War and their secession from the Union. He plans to punish only the highest levels of the Confederate Army. So 16,000 Confederate soldiers are actually pardoned. They are not punished at all. So again, this is really going to anger uh, the Union side of uh, the soldiers who had fought for the Union in the American Civil War. So Northerners are going to be very annoyed by this. 
Number three, he returns land that had previously been given to ex-slaves. So the Sea Islands, for example, were returned back to white southerners. Only 2,000 African-American families managed to hold on to the land that they had been given. So again, something that was a really positive step during the American Civil War has now been reversed. And Johnson had clearly gone against Lincoln's progress for African-Americans because southern states started to pass what were known as the Black Codes. These stopped African-Americans serving on juries, banned marriages between black and white Americans and made it illegal for African-Americans to own weapons. Now, it's really, really important that you know a couple of examples of these black codes. Um, so please, can I encourage you to have a look at that list and just pick one or two that you can remember for the exam? So following President Johnson's uh, negative policies for African-Americans, we see a phase of radical reconstruction where things improved dramatically. So Congress were very angry with Johnson's changes. They had all been made when Congress hadn't been meeting at the start of his presidency, and Congress used their power to undo many of Johnson's policies and aim to improve the lives of African-Americans again. And this becomes known as radical reconstruction. Think of it as radical because it is going against the grain. Remember, up until this point, there had been huge levels of embedded racism and discrimination. And this is an attempt to try and reverse some of that, which is quite a radical policy. So first of all, we see something set up called the Freeman's Bureau. So this is where Congress made this permanent. It had been Lincoln's idea and it took land from ex-slaveholders and gave it to ex-slaves. It also helped them with education and health care. So quite a dramatic policy that could improve the lives of African-Americans. Civil Rights Bill, which made it illegal to deny anyone their civil rights um, and anyone that did could be imprisoned or fined. So again, a huge step. Uh, towards equality. We then have the 14th Amendment. So remember the 13th Amendment has banned slavery. The 14th Amendment states that all people born within the United States, regardless of their race, were classed as citizens. This obviously means that they are protected by the law and this will reduce the amount of discrimination that African Americans face. Number four, we have black men in Washington, D.C. We're given the right to vote. This isn't women. This is only men. But nonetheless, it is a step in the right direction in terms of democ uh, democracy. So this paves the way for other states and is promising for many African-Americans. We also have the Reconstruction Act. So they banned all people who fought for the Confederacy in the American Civil War from voting. This required Confederate states to allow black Americans to vote and agree to accept the 13th and 14th Amendments before they were allowed to run themselves again. So this is making the um, what was the Confederacy take some accountability for their actions during the American Civil War. And finally, number six, President Grant, who was an ex-Union general, replaces Johnson in 1870 and he passes the 15th Amendment, which states that all US citizens have the right to vote regardless of their race. So within quite a short period of time, we've seen the 13th Amendment where slavery is banned, the 14th Amendment, which sees all people as citizens regardless of race, and then the 15th Amendment, which allows all US citizens the right to vote regardless of their race. So they are amendments that you need to know and revise for the exam. And I would suggest you learn a couple more policies that are on the slide now that really allow you to explain why radical reconstruction was such progress uh, during the reconstruction phase. So the final phase of reconstruction is where radical reconstruction, all of that progress that had been made is reversed. So we see the roller coaster go back down again at this point. So radical reconstruction slowed down as many key Republicans were dying, and this meant that there were less radical reconstructionists within Congress. So they can't have their voice heard. And as a result of that, um, radical reconstruction policies aren't being pushed forwards anymore. It doesn't help as well that the Republicans lose their majority in Congress in the 1874 elections. Um, which means that there are more Democrats who remember are pro-Southern who are going to be having more of a say in Congress and racial policy. The Freedmen's Bureau, as a result of this, is closed down as funds could not be found. And this meant that a lot of support for ex-slaves was lost. 
we see the KKK and the White League were growing in popularity in the South. So they were targeting any black Americans who were using their right to vote to join the 15th Amendment. So remember the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, um, extremely violent and aggressive group who um, were lynching African Americans, were using extreme violence against them, torture against them as a result of the fact that they were black. Many black Americans in the South also became what was known as sharecroppers. These were black families who lived on land owned by white southerners and they had to give the white southerners two thirds of their crops as rent. White landowners could also threaten to take their land back at any time. And many did not dare to use their voting rights against their white landowners. Now, you can clearly see here that sharecropping sounds not too dissimilar, really, from slavery. So there is very little progress when sharecropping becomes uh, a major policy, really, in the South. When radicals complained to President Grant, he promised to send assistance, but he failed to do so. Remember, they've lost their um, majority in Congress and Grant is worried about losing his presidency. So he's worried that white voters would turn against him if he focused on reconstruction rather than the economy. And finally, we have some Supreme Court rulings in 1873, which state that nothing in the Constitution, um, there is nothing in sorry, to say that African-Americans had to be treated equally at state level. So segregation was reintroduced in the South. Remember, the South believe in strong state rights and a weaker central government. They are uh, reading into the Constitution to say that they should be allowed the right to have segregation if that is what they want. And the Constitution did not give the national government the power to intervene if black voters were being stopped from voting, which, as we've said, was happening with groups such as the KKK and the White League. So that is our roller coaster of reconstruction. And you need to know the ups and downs and some examples of policies along the way. Here you have a number of past paper questions from the third time period and third theme of Making of America, 1861 to 1877. So have a go at some of these questions as part of your revision. You can see that there have been no nine or ten mark questions on this theme so far. Um, so use the video on how to answer the exam questions for Making of America to support you as you write any answers to the questions that you can see. Have a think about what kind of things the exam board could ask you for a nine mark or a ten mark question to do with this theme. And the next video in this series for the Making of America will again be on the third time period, but for the second topic within that, which is settlement and conflict on the plains, 1861 to 1877.